Good evening to all of you and welcome to the Monday, September 23rd, 2019 meeting of the Falls Church City Council. We are delighted you all are here with us this evening. Um, I'd like to call our meeting to order and ask that you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, Madam Clerk, will you call roll, please? Yes, sir. Ms. Conley? Here. Mr. Duncan? Here. Ms. Hardy? Here. Here. Mr. Lickenhaus? Here. Mr. Snyder? Here. Mr. Z? Here. And Mayor Tarter? Here. Thank you, Council. Thank you. And do we have a uh, motion regarding the meeting agenda? Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt the meeting agenda. We have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Um, before we get started, I have a bit of sad news I'd like to share and maybe ask for a brief moment of silence. Um, uh, Alexandra Mahler, who is the daughter of Kim and Dan Mahler, um, formerly of Falls Church. Dan was one of our colleagues on city council. Um, but his daughter uh, died suddenly on Sunday, and so I'd ask if we could all just please have a moment of silence in honor of her and her family. All right, thank you all. Um, we've got a number of proclamations, and various members of council are going to do the honors. The first one relates to Indigenous Peoples Day, and Ms. Hardy is going to, uh, to read that one. So, Ms. Hardy? Great. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas the indigenous peoples of the lands that would later become known as the Americas have occupied these lands since time immemorial, and whereas the Commonwealth of Virginia is built upon the homelands and villages of the indigenous peoples of this region, without whom the founding of the Commonwealth would not have been possible, and whereas many contributions have been made to our nation through indigenous peoples' knowledge, labor, technology, science, philosophy, and arts, and these deep cultural contributions have substantially shaped the character of the United States, and whereas the City Council opposes systemic racism towards indigenous peoples in our country, which perpetuates poverty and income inequality and exacerbates disproportionate health, education, and social instability. And whereas the City of Falls Church wishes to help close the equity gap for indigenous peoples through practices that reflect their experiences, ensure greater access and opportunity, and honor our nation's indigenous roots, history, and contributions, and whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in 1977 by a delegation of Native Nations to the United Nations sponsored International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas. And whereas the City Council wishes to encourage the community to reflect upon the many contributions as well as the continuing struggles of Indigenous peoples. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby recognize Monday, October 11th, 2019 as Indigenous Peoples Day in the City of Falls Church and direct the city manager to include this designation on city communications regarding the hol holiday designated on that day. Is there any member of the public who's here to receive this proclamation? All right, please come forward and you're welcome to say a few words if you'd like. As you come forward, I'd like to thank Ms. Hardy, or Council uh, Member Hardy, who's also taken a leadership role in this proclamation. But go ahead, ma'am. Thank hi. you. Uh, hi, my name is Linda Kamel, and uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, I want to th thank the City of Falls Church for um, supporting this bill. Uh, see if that camera. green light's on. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It may be that the green light there is not on just yet. There it is. <laughs> okay, so th uh, this year we're doing the second annual coat drive again. And thank you for the city for, uh, for supporting that um, uh, effort. The coat dry is just going to be uh, for about two weeks from the 14th of October to the 24th. It's going to be at the community center at, and at the library. And we're asking for um, gently used uh, coats. Mo uh, hooded coats are, are, are better. And um, also uh, hoodies and uh, baby blankets and blankets for um, children. Also asking for um, donations of um, soap <laughs> because they are they need soap basically not in plastic bottles but the hard bars and um, a new socks um, and uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes so the collection boxes will be at the community center and um, the library during those times. That's All right. Well, thank you for leading those efforts. Would you like to come forth and uh, receive the proclamation? Maybe get your photo taken with us at council.
Okay, thank you so much. Uh -huh. All right, our next proclamation is uh, declaring June 20th through the 21st, 2020 as George Mason High School Alumni Celebration week net Weekend, and Vice Mayor Connolly is going to do the honors. I am, and I'd like to invite um, Judy White Dressendorfer and Cricket Moore to come stand at the podium. They are George Mason High School alumni, and I'm not sure if there's any other alumni in the room, but you're welcome to join in as well. This is a proclamation um, that we're going to think about for the whole entire school year coming up. So this is a proclamation declaring June 20th through 21st, 2020 as George Mason High School Alumni Celebration Weekend. Whereas George Mason High School opened in 1952 and the 67 classes that graduated from George Mason High School between 1953 and 2019 include thousands of alumni living all over the world engaging in a wide variety of life pursuits. And whereas alumni of George Mason High School wish to bring together alumni, families, and friends to share memories and achievements and to celebrate Falls Church schools and the community. And whereas throughout the years, George Mason High School alumni have been outstanding, outstanding examples of community-minded citizens who have served as important role models in our community across the nation and around the world. And whereas George Mason High School has been highly acclaimed both statewide and nationally, providing its students and alumni with educational opportunities and whereas on June 20th to 21st, 2020, George Mason High School alumni will be invited to return for an all-class reunion, celebrating their memories of George Mason High School and their years in the city of Falls Church. And whereas the city council welcomes George Mason High School alumni and joins with a very proud community in expressing appreciation to all alumni for their ongoing achievement and service. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby recognize June 20th through the 21st, 2020, as George Mason High School Alumni Celebration Weekend in the City of Falls Church, Virginia, and encourage all citizens to participate in welcoming our alumni home. So, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, Appreciate it. Absolutely. You're welcome to say a few words if you're so inclined. If not, you... Uh, I just want to thank you, and I want to also say that because the city was originally founded for the purpose of controlling their own education for their children, this is going to be a special celebration celebrating the city for the education it provides to the alumni and celebrating the alumni for all of their successes and accomplishments. So we really do ask for donations, uh, financial donations from the citizens of Falls Church, and also we're hoping that we will have um, from the businesses perhaps some discounts and advertising, etc. So the alumni will um, stay at the local hotel, shop at the local shops, and bring business in for that particular time. Thank you. Do you have anything? No. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Oh, you go ahead. All right. Our As next they're sitting down, I just want to say real quick that although none of us on the dais, I think, are alumni of George Mason High School, we have two people that are married to alumni of George Mason High School and several of us who have children who are graduates. So we, as a city council, are very pleased to participate in this. All right. So our next proclamation uh, is declaring October 2019 as Urban Agriculture Month. Oh, wow. And Mr. Lichtenhouse is going to do the honors. Ross? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Whereas since colonial times, agriculture has been an important part of the Commonwealth's economy with early colonists and their families working on the land to raise food for themselves and their livestock. And whereas, although the city, the Commonwealth, and the nation have become increasingly suburban and urban, 
Agriculture continues to play an important role in Virginia's economy and in Falls Church with farmers markets, community gardens, and other urban agriculture education and awareness programs. Whereas the city is a member of the Healthy Eating Active Living Campaign, which promotes healthy food access, the city provided a demonstration community garden in the summer of 2018, and the city is updating the natural resources chapter of the comprehensive plan to include support for urban agriculture policies. And whereas George Mason High School and Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School students are currently involved with hydroponics and aquaponics, where they plant, grow, harvest, and sell lettuce to be used for school lunches, and the Falls Church City Public Schools intend to use these systems for the sustainability programs at the new high school and continued use for the school's backpack program. And whereas urban agriculture helps strengthen sustainable community food systems, both locally and regionally, enhances education and learning, and bolsters food security while providing entrepreneurs with new opportunities. And whereas the Virginia Cooperative Extension reports that if every family in Virginia spent $10 a week on fresh local food and farm-based Virginia products, more than $1.65 billion in economic impact would be generated to strengthen more localized food production. And whereas the General Assembly designated October as Urban Agriculture Month in Virginia to provide the opportunity to promote and educate Virginians about the benefit and importance of urban agriculture programs to local communities. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim October 2019 as mm -hmm. Urban Agriculture Month in the City of Falls Church to promote and educate residents about the benefit and importance of urban agriculture programs in our community. Is there anyone in the uh, audience who's gonna receive this proclamation? All right, come on down. Good evening, Council. Carly Aubrey with the planning staff. Um, just wanted to thank you for accepting this proclamation and also thank Nancy Vincent with Health and Human Services and Peter Mecca, Richard Kane, and Jason Perkins from Falls Church Public Schools for their input on it. Um, I think, no, not sure you're aware, but urban agriculture has grown in popularity over the past several years, both on a local level and on a regional and federal level, even for the reasons listed in this proclamation. Um, Arlington County has urban agriculture program. Fairfax County Food Council has an urban ag working group. Uh, the Council of Governments has a regional agriculture initiative which recognizes urban ag as providing green infrastructure benefits. And the 2018 Federal Farm Bill created new authorities specific to urban agriculture, including $25 million a year of appropriations. So um, including what we've done to date, um, we are working to update the natural resources chapter to um, initiative an initiative for an urban ag program so hopefully there'll be more good things to come that's great and mr lichtenhaus is a strong proponent of uh urban agriculture I don't very much so add. you have anything to add or uh i know that there are two very eager energetic fifth grade girls that will be here in front of this council in the very near future to talk about urban ag and some of the uh, green amenities that we have in this city so i will leave you guys on the edge of your seats <laughs> as it relates to that Go Urban Ag. All right. right. And Ms. Hardy. Uh, so Ms. Aubrey, I know that your vegetable garden outside Temporary City Hall was really popular last year. Are there plans to do something similar outside the new building now? There are. There's nothing. There's very preliminary stuff in the works. There's been discussions. Um, but um, time is a limited commodity these days. So, But that is the goal. I'll volunteer council to help out. OK. Excellent. Outside would be a great place for vertical gardening so. <laughs> all right thank you very much we're going to volunteer for stuff you got to come to my backyard and we can start regrowing pumpkins i used to grow pumpkins in the 80s <laughs> all right we appreciate you. your efforts uh, we did uh, i omitted um national um, uh, community planning month mr duncan's going to do the honors mr duncan thank you mr mayor whereas change is constant and affects all county cities and towns including the city of falls church and whereas community planning can help manage change in ways that improve outcomes for how people work, live, and play, and whereas community planning and engagement provides an opportunity for all residents to be equally involved in developing a shared vision for the future of the city through enthusiastic participation in local boards and commissions, and whereas the full benefits of planning requires public officials and residents who understand, support, and demand excellence in planning and plan implementation, and whereas the month of October is designated as National Community Planning Month throughout the United States of America and its territories, 
and whereas the American Planning Association and its professional institute, the American Institute of Certified Planners, endorse National Community Planning Month as an opportunity to highlight the contributions sound planning and plan implementation make to the quality of our neighborhoods and environment. And whereas the City of Falls Church continues to advance its community planning initiatives by updating the City's comprehensive plan and development of small area plans, public investments in infrastructure, including civic buildings, multimodal transportation facilities, and parks and open space, and private investments in the City's commercial and residential areas, and whereas the celebration of National Community Planning Month gives us the opportunity to publicly recognize the participation and dedication of the members of planning commissions and other citizen planners who have contributed their time and expertise to the improvement of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, and whereas we recognize the many valuable contributions made by professional community and regional planners of the Commonwealth of Virginia and the National Capital Area and extend our heartfelt thanks for the continued commitment to public service by these professionals. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, mm -hmm. Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby designate October 2019 as Community Planning Month in the City of Falls Church as part of the nationwide celebration of National Community Planning Month. Mr. Stoddard, are you going to say a few words? Is that the plan? Uh, All right. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tarter and uh, the members of the City Council. I'm Jeff Holland from the planning staff. Uh, for those who don't know, planning can be summed up as a comprehensive community-focused choices that enhance the spaces where people live, work, and play. While many people may not realize it, planning has a significant impact on their day-to-day -day life. From where they live to how they commute to the type of home they live in, planning plays a vital role in, in a person's life and well-being. Established in 2006, National Community Planning Month is celebrated each October as a way to highlight the role of planners and the importance of good planning in our communities. Each year, a theme is identified by the American Planning Association to help a community highlight an aspect or outcome of planning. This year's theme is planning for infrastructure that benefits all. Infrastructure is, br is defined broadly, extending to different types of projects ranging from roadways to transportation systems to parks and broadband networks. Housing is another critical component of a community's infrastructure. Well-planned infrastructure projects strengthen communities, boost the economy, expand opportunity, and promote equitable development. Ensuring that all residents in a community have safe and affordable housing options advances economic and social equity goals. To celebrate National Community Planning Month, uh, our city's planning staff are finalizing plans to make ourselves available at, to, to the public at Mr. Brown's Park each Wednesday morning throughout the month of October. We hope you stay tuned for more details on that and join us to talk about the city's infrastructure and other exciting projects we are working on for the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that and for your fine work. And I think the whole planning staff has done just a great job these past few years in particular in really raising the bar here in the city. So thank you. I know we've got a comment or two on the other end of the the table, Ms. Hardy. Oh, I just want to say nice job with parking day. So speaking of planning coming to life, um, I really enjoyed stopping by and I think lots of other visitors enjoyed seeing how that public space was transformed into something that was more creative. So kudos to that. Yeah, thank and you. Al and also thank you for holding um, office hours in the new Mr. Brown's Park. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Our next proclamation relates to uh, Energy Action Month and Mr. Z is going to do the honors. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas energy efficiency is the cheapest, quickest, and cleanest way <coughs> to meet energy needs and reduce utility bills for residential business and industrial customers, and whereas addressing energy efficiency promotes a cleaner environment, a more prosperous economy, and positive economic development, improve comfort and health in homes and businesses at lower costs and a higher quality of life, and Whereas City Council adopted the Regional Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Goals developed by the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments as its own goals applicable to the City Government as well as residents and businesses, and whereas smarter energy use reduces the amount of electricity needed to power our lives, which helps avoid power plant emissions, and whereas energy efficiency also supports efforts to make our community more resilient to the effects of extreme weather events and climate change, 
And whereas the vision of environmental sustainability in the city of Falls Church incorporates energy efficiency and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as core values that embody what the city is striving to achieve. And whereas October is Energy Action Month, a nationwide effort to secure a more prosperous and energy independent future, which depends partly on the ability to address shared energy challenges and encourage diverse, clean, and efficient energy production. And whereas a nationwide network of energy efficient groups and partners has designated the first Wednesday in October as the National Annual Energy Efficiency Day. And whereas the city has focused on achieving higher levels of energy efficiency in renovations such that the new, newly renovated city hall shows preliminary savings of 30% or more over 2017 electricity usage. And whereas the new George Mason High School was planning to achieve energy use intensity of 22, which would make it one of the most energy efficient high schools in Virginia. And whereas guidance to make homes and businesses more energy efficient is readily available through the United States Department of Energy, the Virginia Energy Efficiency Council, the Energy Efficiency Day website, and the city's web pages. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim October, October 2019 as Energy Action Month and do also hereby proclaim October 2nd, 2019 as Energy Efficiency Day in the City of Falls Church and encourage staff, residents, businesses, and organizations to commit to take actions this month and in the future to conserve energy and reduce carbon emissions. Mr. Stevens, I think you might be speaking to us. And while you're coming up, I just want to also thank uh, Mr. Z for his leadership, uh, both here in the region and statewide at VML and with COG on these issues. So thank you both for your efforts. Mr. Stevens. Indeed, our health is becoming more apparent uh, with the passing of every day. So I think it's going to be important that we discuss energy, not only on special occasions like this with a resolution, but also throughout all of the uh, important activities that we conduct here on a local basis, whether that's our comprehensive plan, whether it's our budget, whether uh, it's designing a new building. All of these things involve energy and uh, its effect on climate and our health. So, But for tonight, I just want to thank you for, for giving some recognition to the importance of energy. and I'll. Uh, forego uh, a, a photograph opportunity. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Well, I think we'll all just thank you um, for your efforts as well. And I think uh, we've certainly been raising the bar um, with the leadership of the community on energy efficiency throughout the city. I'm very excited about the new high school being net zero already. So um, a lot of good things happening, I think, on that front here in the city. Ms. Mester, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, all right. Let's move on then to our last proclamation, which is uh, Fire Prevention Week. And Mr. Snyder is going to do the honors. Whereas the City of Falls Church is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting the city, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 2,630 people in the United States in 2017, and fire departments in the United States responded to 357,000 home fires. And whereas the majority of U.S. fire deaths, four out of five, occur at home each year, and the fire death rate per 1,000 home fires reported to U.S. fire departments was actually 4% higher in 2017 than in 1980. And whereas when the smoke alarm sounds, residents may have less than two minutes to escape to safety. And whereas those who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and therefore will be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas residents should make a home escape plan, drawing a map of each level of the home, showing all doors and windows, and teaching children how to escape on their own in case adults can't help them. And whereas residents should practice the home fire escape drill at least twice a year, during the day and at night, make sure everyone in the home knows how to call 911 or the local emergency number from a cell phone or a neighbor's phone, and practice using different ways out. And whereas when a fire strikes, residents should get low and go under the smoke to get out quickly, get out and stay out, never going back inside the home. 
And whereas the 2019 Fire Prevention Week theme effectively serves to remind us that we need to take personal steps to increase our safety from fire. Now, there be, now therefore, be it resolved that I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby recognize October 6th through the 12th, 2019 as Fire Prevention Week in the City of Falls Church and urge all residents to support the efforts of Falls Church Fire and Emergency Services during Fire Prevention Week 2019. I believe we actually have a representative. Is that, uh, come on down uh, from the uh, Falls Church Volunteer Fire Department. So welcome to you, sir, and thank you for your service. Hello. Um, thank you for um, the proclamation. I'm Henry Lane, Deputy Fire Marshal of City of Falls Church. A uh, couple things about fire prevention. It needs to be practiced every day, not just one week out of the year. So go, whether you're at home or at, um, at work, we need to practice that. So the um, fire prevention week will commence uh, midweek of October, and um, the open house will be at Fire Station 6, down, just down the street here on Little Falls. A couple of things we've done in the city for um, fire inspections and um, permits. We have um, done 280 inspections and issued 280 permits. Pretty much a lot of those are assembly permits or a filling station might have a fuel dispensary <coughs> um, permits like that. 810 violations we wrote up um, visiting all these um, places. So there's a lot of issues we've been dealing with, so hopefully in the future that, that will be less. We've generated 64000 in revenue for the city, and um, annually we've had about six to eight fires. So <coughs> keep up the good work on your prevention efforts, and um, hopefully those fires will be reduced. All right, well, thank you for your service to our community and your colleagues. Would you like to come forward and receive this proclamation? Maybe get a photo together? And, and Mayor Turner, could we also ask uh, Chief Gavin and uh, Fire Marshal uh, Tom Pelaer to come forward? Absolutely, and absolutely. Let's all come down here. And, uh, all right. <clears throat> Thank you all for your service. I know it's a uh, beloved part of our community. My children have spent many a day uh, at birthday parties and the like down there. It's, uh, it's a great uh, community event, the open house. I'd also like to mention our colleague, Dave Snyder, who just read this, I think is a trained EMT, if I'm not mistaken, a volunteer EMT and served on 9-11, um, if memory serves correctly as well. So uh, thank you for your service, Mr. Snyder. I think that is it for the proclamations. Are there any oaths of office uh, to new board and commission members, Madam Clerk? Uh, no, sir. All right, we're gonna move now to receipt of public comments. Do you wanna go ahead and summarize the written comments? Yes, and I actually want to mention that the Indigenous Peoples Day did have a typographical error, and we should declare that day for October 14th, if that's all right with council, and we'll fix that proclamation. So declared. Thank you. <clears throat> the written comments we received uh, from, uh, first one is from Margaret Schwartz of 313 Lincoln Avenue. She urged council to continue to implement infrastructure projects and uh, discuss them with the public and ask that bicyclists be ticketed if they don't follow traffic laws. Craig Burry provided comments on the walkability of the city and providing safe paths away from automobiles. Patrick Conley wrote with ideas for making dockless scooters a benefit to the community while making sure they do not litter the sidewalks or endanger pedestrians. And Jeannie Thackeray of 412 Southwest Street said that while she would prefer a ban on dockless scooters, she would suggest several restrictions if they are allowed, including banning them from certain areas and requiring helmets. All right, thank you very much. We're now gonna uh, move on to the receipt of public comments. At the present time, I only have one speaker slip. Anyone else is welcome to fill one out the back of the room, hand them to the clerk, and she will hand them to me, and I will call you up to speak. 
Um, we ask that you keep your comments to three minutes and state your name and address for the record. Um, our first and only speaker at this time is Jessica Hagenbart. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, sir. All right, come on forward. Welcome. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. My husband, Brian, and I uh, come, came this evening because we understand there will be some discussion on traffic calming um, for cut-through street problems that we have in the city. Uh, and we also heard that there was an incident of a child being struck by a car last week. And so given that, we wanted to share our story that uh, we had a son that was almost hit by a car last week uh, right in front of our house. We just bought a house on 206 Marshall street which is there's an s curve just past uh tj the the road turns into from oak into marshall street and there's that big s curve and there was the driver i think was blinded and my son was also blinded i was right there i saw him look both ways i was had already crossed the street he went back to get something um I don't know if it was like 10 or 20 feet, uh, you know, uh, as far, but it was enough to get me freaked out. And he was also very freaked out um, by the incident. Um, so that I think the problem was the curve created a blind spot. We had we had a bunch of bushes that were there in a tree. And we also had a p car parked in front of our street that also was part of the problem. We don't, and we also don't have a sidewalk on that side of the street. So the very next day, all those bushes and the tree were gone because it was that upsetting to, to me. Like I wanted to do everything that we could to make sure that our kids are as safe as possible, which I'm sure is important to all of you. Um, we also decided as a family, we're not gonna park uh, in front of our house anymore um, because we don't want that there to be a blind spot. But then there's also, so you know, there's a better vision down the street, but there's also the problem of cut through people. And now they can see more and they could probably drive faster now too, even faster than they were before. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people that are cutting through from 29 to seven uh, via that street. And uh, anyway, I know you all take child, child safety very importantly. And um, Thank you for giving me the time to share our story. And um, I would like to just ask that you consider our street um, as part of the effort to, to make safer. And um, I also request more aggressive or active measures um, as far as instead of just signs, uh, si some si additional signs would be great, no entrance unless you have a, per a permit or something. Um, but really I, I request your um, aggressiveness to fix this problem, because I know it's a problem throughout the whole area, really. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We we're happy to hear your uh, your child wasn't injured, but we understand your concern, and I think we as a council take this very seriously and would like to find ways to accelerate traffic calm. I think you'll hear a little bit about that later on this evening. But thank you very much for sharing with us, uh, Mr. Z. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, a potentially hor horrific story. and, and uh, um, we wish we could do more, and although we have a very um, robust program of uh, traffic calming and, and a committee, uh, the CACT, that's up to, to hear uh, citizen uh, comments and a admittedly long process to address these concerns, uh, it is just, I think, unfathomable that we um, don't do the common sense things that we can do. Uh, and just to, uh, for example, we could lower the speed limit. Uh, we have the right to do so. And, uh, and all the streets, the quiet pedestrian streets where most people uh, recognize that these vehicles we drive these days are very large. They effectively make them one-way streets. And so people stop, but it only takes one person who sees a 25 mile an hour speed limit as <coughs> 35. And uh, I say this tonight because backing out of my driveway and then coming here, um, it was almost dark, um, narrowly escaped having the back end of my vehicle um, hit uh, with a car speeding by uh, without the lights. Um. And so, you know, I think that maybe if we had a, as we suggested earlier, a uh, self-identified streets that would volunteer to have a lower speed limit, um, which again is our right and our ability to do so within Virginia laws. So we should at least try that. Uh, we certainly 
don't have enough money and resources to stripe or put speed humps on, on every street or the bump out, so it'll take us a while to do that. Uh, signs are cheap, so uh, hopefully with uh, your testimony and my recent experience, and by the way, this person had the audacity to honk at me, <clears throat> of course. Um, so I would ask the city manager to uh, and the plan director to uh, come forward with a plan to uh, have neighborhoods self-identify streets that they would like to have the speed limit lowered. Let's try that. And if it works, fabulous. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I might, um, I want to pile onto this conversation as well. Jess, uh, appreciate you and Brian uh, coming tonight. Um, so over the last week, you know, we've had two reported incidents, uh, either of a child almost being hit, um, which was just around the corner from our house, um, Brian and Jess's son, uh, and then uh, another young lady who was actually hit, luckily just her backpack and pulled into traffic. And, you know, similar to Mr. Mr. Z's comments, I'm going to take a little bit more of an aggressive stance because over the last six months, maybe it's because I'm working from home more often, maybe it's because I'm walking around more often, um, I, I, would, I would like to think that uh, that's what it is. But unfortunately, I think that um, what we have been faced with is not just cut through traffic, but... I would say we, we haven't taken aggressive enough measures related to neighborhood uh, traffic calming, um, speed calming measures, and we've been talking about this for quite some time, and I think it's gotten to uh, a tipping point, frankly. And I think the old approach uh, Mr. Z referred to of this going through a Citizen Transportation Committee is a bit archaic for this city. Uh, once it was a sleepy little city uh, where some of the traffic calming measures we had to deal with weren't as extreme as we have to deal with now. Uh, I think it requires a citywide effort to address some of these issues. I've personally raised those cut through streets from Westmoreland all the way up to West Rosemary from the 29 to Broad Street cut through uh, as an issue. On a personal note, yeah, we have a four month old puppy that was hit by a van uh, a few weeks ago. Um, got out of the hands of my uh, seven-year-old daughter, ran into traffic, and was hit by a van that didn't even break, didn't slow down. Uh, three nights in a hospital, broken pelvis, dozens of stitches. I'm not even sure the guy could have seen her as fast as he was going. Uh, with three little girls yelling, two adults yelling, just cratered the dog. Luckily, it survived. It was short enough to fit under the chassis of the van. Uh, but this is the reality of the situation. A number of us on that side of the city are required to go to bus stops, cross the street without crosswalks, without sidewalks on some areas, narrow streets that are straight enough. If you pull up a map, it almost looks like a drag strip from Lee Highway all the way to Seton Lane and then up to Broad Street. And we have very little police presence, not because uh, we don't have the effort, but because I think we just literally don't have the resources to cover it at the appropriate times. Um, during school hours, in drop off and pick up, it's becoming a systemic problem, a systemic problem over there. And it is only a matter of time before one of these kids are hit. And we cannot wait for dozens of projects to sit in a transportation committee, not because people don't care, because we don't have the resources time, because if one of these kids gets hit, the number of times we've been talking about neighborhood traffic calming in this city and on council, I would consider all of us culpable at this particular point in time. And it's not because we don't have the money. We sat here a few weeks ago and talked about a two and a half million dollar surplus. And I, for one, given what's happened just over the last week, both in our neighborhood and on the north side of the city, would refuse to approve putting any money into any project unless we've got neighborhood traffic calming on that list with a timeline and a strategy for execution to do some of the things that we've been talking about for years. Solving problems we've been talking about for years that we know that are well within our right as a local jurisdiction to solve for. So it's time for us to put some time, some effort, and some resources to mitigating the dangers of speeding, of inept driving through this city, whether it's signs, speed tables, narrowing of jurisdictions, or just repainting the crosswalks in some cases. These are simple things that we can do that we need to address now. Not six months from now, not a year from now when it finally works its way through a, commu uh, a, a community transportation committee, but right now. So I look forward to hearing what the city has to say about some of the issues that we're going to address on the north side of the city. But from a resident that lives on the side of the city that has cut through traffic on a regular basis, 
I would certainly like to hear about some solutions that we can make now before a child is hit and killed because I seem to hear about these stories on a weekly basis. I think it's just unfortunate that we haven't taken the time to address these. So Jess, Brian, thank you guys for your time and I look forward to the city uh, and some of the strategies we can employ to help prevent something like this from happening again. All right, thank you. Are there other comments? Um, thank you for coming out. I, as you hear, uh, we're all very concerned about um, the safety of our children. So I know the uh, chief of police is here. I don't want to put you on the spot. I would just suggest to you, you probably have heard some of this conversation. I know you were out for part of it as well. But um, anything we can do as far as neighborhood policing, particularly in the mornings and afternoons when there's an awful lot of kids on the streets, um, and uh, uh, anything we can do to that uh, regards, I think, would be helpful. So maybe having a conversation with the city manager and, and things we can figure out a way to do to just um, uh, things we can do quickly and maybe a police presence could be assistance as well so um, i know that's not your i don't want to put you on the spot right this moment but please um and you're welcome to come forward if you'd like um but if you are not prepared that's fine as well i certainly don't want to put you on the spot i i did not hear all of the uh, testimony tonight but i will tell you number one complaint in most communities is traffic and um uh, we do have a lot of cut through traffic obviously in the city and I would dare say 66 has uh, put more traffic into the city because of the tolls on a 66 um, and it's a real problem on the side roads um, in terms of our resources you're right we don't have a lot of resources in terms of putting a marked cruiser in all these spots but there are tactics um, there are um, assets that we can put out on the streets that can measure and or give warning to those that are driving through um, certainly could put marked vehicles in certain spots um, to hopefully slow some people down um, but i will certainly get with this um, this lady here and ask her what her testimony was and review the testimony i'm certainly aware what happened on west um, we we're very very fortunate um, there are a lot of things that we have done in the city um, i think to leverage technology which has been very effective, may it be the red light um, program that we have not only on the street, but also on the buses. Um, that was an initiative brought by the citizens um, that we have done with the schools and uh, the police department. Uh, so we are leveraging technology, um, all the assets we have in terms of traffic measurement. Uh, but I would agree, um, sometimes it's not as fruitful to get and sit on residential streets, secondary residential streets, and try and catch one or two of them um, driving down because oftentimes they're seen. It's, it's kind of uh, somewhat difficult. Um, but we will do our best and um, reallocate some out resources, especially on the cut-throughs, um, and obviously working with uh, traffic engineering to see where the priorities are on the city. Uh, but I don't have any statistics for you tonight. Um, but we were certainly put out all the assets that we do have, the trailer, the speed cameras, um, the traffic counts, um, marked cruisers. We can park them strategically through the city and uh, write some tickets. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Snyder. Um, so this is a problem with a lot of causes, and um, I think likewise a solution has got to have a lot of component parts. We've talked about a couple of them. And I hope we will dedicate a portion of the um, so-called surplus to an additional portion to traffic calming. We did that in a prior year, so I think we should do it this year as well. Secondly, I'm glad to hear from the chief about enforcement. I would ask the chief to provide me data on the, um, to the extent the traffic is being diverted off I-66, and we'll bring that to the attention of the Virginia Department of Transportation immediately because they claim that that would not happen. So I'm interested in that. Um, the next thing I'm interested in is making some of this part of our legislative program. You can't have speed cameras in, um, in the state of Virginia, as I understand it. Maryland does. That's clearly something that would have a major impact, and so I think we ought to add that to our legislative agenda. Finally, um, there's a regional aspect to this. And um, at my request, the Transportation Planning Board has heard from the three DOTs for the, over the course of the past year. And um, so they've all set goals for reduction in injuries and fatalities on the highways, and they've all totally missed those goals. And instead of reducing fatalities on the highways in the region, the numbers are actually going up. 
So it's clearly, uh, there are many elements to this. I think um, we've heard counsel say what some of those elements are today. With regard to the process for um, getting traffic calming in, I totally agree. It's way too long, and I would ask the city manager to come up with a much more speedy process, and I think it's up to the city council to provide the funds, and we can start with that surplus. Thanks much. All right. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to council requests. Before we get to those, I would just note that the city manager is going to speak to some of the um, pedestrian and traffic calming concerns and also stormwater. So, uh, but if there are other requests or other items, uh, now would be the time. Vice Mayor Connolly. Mr. Shields, I had a request from uh, the St. James PTA. They want to make sure that there's a crossing guard that's going to be reassigned to their corner. So there, there are, uh, we are in, t in touch directly with the St. James uh, leadership, and um, and I don't have the details of, of what the resolution of that is going to be. You know, the the police um, are working with them to meet the highest needs that St. James might have, and and I just don't have the latest on what that discussion is. But I can assure you that that communication is happening. So the police are working with the school administration? They are. Okay. Whether a crossing guard at that location is, not is in fact, what St. James views as, is the greatest need, I think that's the reason I'm not stating affirmatively that that's what we're going to do. But we're, we're working with them to make sure that they have what they need. And, um, and, and that's the nature of the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Any other requests? All right. Let's move on then to the report <coughs> of the city manager, Mr. Shields. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Tarter, members of council. As you noted at the beginning, I would like to provide the council with an update on transportation projects, including uh, some of the ones referenced earlier tonight, um, and also provide an update on stormwater, um, uh, our efforts on that front. But before I get to those two items, if I could make uh, two personnel announcements for council and, and introductions. And I'd like to start with Steve Mason, who is here and uh, uh, right behind Cindy. Uh, Steve has been hired as our new Human Resources Director, and uh, he comes to us from the city of Alexandria, um, where he uh, started his career as a police officer and rose to the rank of lieutenant. Uh, he joined the uh, police work as a veteran of the United States Army, and um, after retiring as a police officer, uh, worked as an investigator for the Air Alexandria Office of Human Rights, and then was pulled into the city manager's office to work, uh, help the city manager work through some difficult change issues that he was trying to uh, uh, pursue with the city of Alexandria. And then from there, uh, went uh, full time into human resources. Right. And um, so uh, he brings a lot of experience, a great depth of professionalism, and a lot of dynamism and enthusiasm. And uh, he has been out meeting everybody, uh, all of our employees, and we're really glad to welcome him here in the City Falls Church. Thank you very much. Well, welcome. Your, impress your resume is very impressive, and we are delighted to have you on board. Thank you, uh, Mayor Tarter and members of the City Council. I really appreciate this opportunity, particularly the faith that um, the City Manager has placed in me in leading the Human Resources Department. I also want to thank uh, Deputy City Manager Cindy Mester for her efforts over the last couple of years, and we do have an outstanding staff, and I really look forward to uh, working with them. Um, I've been familiar with Falls Church for a long time. I'm not sure how I got the Falls Church newsletter in my email, <laughs> but some time ago, years ago, it showed up, and I've been following ever since then. Uh, the chief of police. I've, I've known her since she was in the police academy. I was one of her instructors. I won't tell you about that. Oh, she's still here. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> and there are other members of the police department as well. Uh, the city clerk, I'm very familiar with uh, uh, Ms. Heath. Uh, from you didn't arrest her, did you? Well, I, no, I did not, but uh, <laughs> I guess yeah, I, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I was a speaker for the International Institute of Muni Municipal Clerks, and that's when I uh, first met her. And uh, so this seems like a great place. Uh, it felt like coming home, as I told uh, the city manager. And just last week, I read a guest commentary by Councilwoman Hardy, and one of the last things you said was, the little city has a big heart and you're hoping that it's going to get big arms. 
and I believe that it will. It, it does have that big heart, even after just a week of, of being here and being in this city government. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, and welcome to Falls Church. We're thank delighted you. to have you. We do have uh, very dedicated employees, and the, de and the employees have hard work as to do all the things that the community wants and to serve uh, the community, and having a strong HR director I will really help all of our employees um, pull out the best and, and help them perform at their best. So glad you're here. The second personnel announcement, you heard from Henry Lane earlier tonight, but we did want uh, the council and the public to be aware that Tom Polera has let us know that he is uh, heading towards retirement, not tomorrow, but on approximately about a three months time frame from now. And uh, Henry Lane will uh, be cycling in to take on uh, greater responsibilities and to be the city's fire official. Um, and we'll have more opportunities to celebrate Tom's achievements in the city. Just to note a few, um, but he has greatly professionalized our emergency coordination and emergency planning citywide, as well as um, greatly upgrading the safety, uh, fire safety of particularly our commercial buildings in the city. He really focused on the inspections uh, with our established uh, uh, commercial buildings. They had been neglected, I think, frankly, and, and, he, and he came and he helped all these business owners and the, and the office buildings and the grocery stores and, and all of the commercial buildings in the city come up to code. And um, notably at the Eden Center, which is sprinkled now, they, had a, they have had fires, they've been suppressed through this new system and avoided potential uh, serious damage. So uh, we thank Tom for his work, and we'll do more of that uh, before he leaves. But uh, we just want to congratulate Henry Lane um, and, um, and send, wish him Godspeed as he step, steps into these uh, greater responsibilities. And I think they, the both of them, have they left? Yes. Okay. There wasn't a fire, was it? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'd like to uh, provide an update, as I mentioned at the beginning, on uh, transportation projects and on stormwater projects. And I'll do it verbally, and we'll follow up with more detail, more graphics. Um, and I'll start with, uh, with uh, stormwater. The, uh, the stormwater projects um, that we are focused on, the, um, we're, we're putting them into two categories. Um, those that are smaller that will be handled in-house and that the, the engineering for is, is starting immediately. Uh, those would include the drainage issues between Laura and Poplar uh, that you've heard about on several occasions. The uh, flooding issues that we had at uh, Lincoln at the 913-915 uh, block of Lincoln uh, those we think we can address through in-house engineering and, and tackle those immediately. There are larger watersheds in the city, call them sort of stream uh, watersheds, that we need engineering help for. So GKY has been given a scope of work, uh, GKY engineering has been given a scope of work um, to, to do uh, hydrology and propo uh, propose solutions with cost estimates for the Trammel Branch, this is the area that drains West Columbia and Shadow Walk, uh, where the pipe under the WNOD is undersized and has caused backflows and, and uh, flooding in the neighborhood I just mentioned. The Hillwood Avenue area, where we have principally backyard flooding and ponding and uh, potentially uh, a back, uh, water jumping over the curb onto people's property, that is the second study area. A third uh, study area is the Sharrow Avenue area. Obviously this is in the 100-year floodplain, but the things we'll be looking at specifically is when we have heavy rain events, we have water that jumps the curb, and, and Trips Run might be still within its banks, but water is jumping over the curb and over private property, flooding homes on its way to Trips Run. Um, and so that will be looking at additional inlets, um, and culverts to help with that problem um, in that area. The East Columbia uh, and uh, Harrison Branch area, this was area that was flooded during the Labor Day storms in 2018 and again on July 8th this summer. 
Um, the Harrison Branch drainage area, we will be looking at solutions that would help property on East Columbia um, and on East Jefferson and the cul-de-sac there on East Jefferson. Um, we'll be looking at options for overland relief as well as additional capacity in the system there. Um, and then lastly, the area that uh, GKY has been asked to look at is an Ellison Branch study. This is also in that Lincoln Avenue area that I mentioned earlier that we'd handle in-house. But if you go further west up Lincoln, uh, where a whole lot of new homes have been built uh, that were formerly uh, one lot and then they did the split lots. <coughs> uh, looking at additional stormwater infrastructure there. Uh, currently, uh, the stormwater is flowing such that it does go through the private property, floods the basements, and then goes down into uh, in a, a daylit stream that's between people's, uh, Steeples Court and those new homes on Lincoln. So that's the study area there. Um, those are the, the five major areas that we're looking for a scope of work with GKY. Um, ultimately, we will get options, uh, we'll get costs, and we'll need to work together to prioritize our resources on where they can do the most good uh, for the buck and, and sort of uh, uh, stack those up over time. Um, and we'll have that discussion uh, in the winter and in, in the budget time, uh, time frame. So that is a, a quick update on stormwater. The um, other things, as Council is aware, we have completed the wing wall on Trips Run that, that washed out during the flood. Um, that is complete. So that, that was a severe risk for the homes on Sheriff Avenue as, as that situation. Um, so it's good to have that resolved. Um, and with this um, list of work, uh, people have been seeing us out in the field doing some of the initial uh, walkthroughs with the engineers, and we'll get communication out to the neighbors just to explain to them and provide them with an update of, of the directions that we're going on this. But just um, if I could interrupt briefly, yes. can you put that on the website, that update as well? Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll get this out to the neighbors as well. We haven't done so partly because GKY has not yet, yet gotten back with us on the pricing for the scope, and, and we just want to know that one of our missions is to um, have a bias towards dollars going towards projects uh, as opposed to study and engineering and, and, and overworking the, the front end of it. Um, and so we want to make sure that GKY understands the scope um, and before we share this out. But that's why it hasn't been sent out yet. Um, so with respect to... Um, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Connolly has yes. a comment, and so does Ms. Hardy. Uh, not to interrupt, but maybe before we move on to transportation. Sure. Thanks for that, Mr. Shields. Um, the ones that we're going to handle in-house, will you also let those residents Absolutely. know? Yes. Because... <clears throat> just so that they know. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hardy? I had a similar comment. It sounds like we're making a lot of progress. Um, I think to, if we can communicate better to those residents, let them know that you know work is happening, that would be re very reassuring for people. Mm -hmm. Do we have timelines on when the in-house work will be done? Um, the goal is this year, so engineering right now, and then, um, as, then as soon as we can get the contracting and things like that into place, we would do it. So. That would be handled out of the current year's stormwater operating budget. And um, so those, we expect those, those issues, people will see action on those um, this year. The, the larger projects, we need to go through the study, then the budget allocations, and then uh, you know, we're talking after July 1st for, for the larger ones. All right, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. But could you continue on with the transportation update? Okay, so for transportation projects, um, let me just provide uh, an update. And these are projects that are not the large CIP projects which you've been briefed on in the past, but uh, projects that are being paid for out of the operating budget and DPW and that people should see this fall. Um, and so let me list what some of those are. Um, what we've discussed um, a little bit tonight is the uh, on Northwest Street, the mid-block crossing there, um, we are uh, meeting with the neighbors there tomorrow morning, um, and we have a pre-construction meeting with the contractor uh, also tomorrow morning. Um, this is a separate meeting, 
but we would expect construction will start fairly soon after that pre-construction meeting. What that is is a uh, concrete bump out to shorten the pedestrian crossing across Northwest Street to access Oak Street um, with a uh, refreshed uh, pedestrian crossing and a, uh, a, a beacon that, will, uh, that is pedestrian activated to, um, to provide an additional signal to cars uh, that, there's a, that, uh, that there's a pedestrian present. Um, on Northwest Street, all of the uh, ped crossings will be refreshed. And at West and Greenwich, uh, that uh, crossing was taken out after uh, an objection by the neighbor. Uh, but there's been a change in the view there. And so that uh, crosswalk will, will be reinstalled at the same time this other work is happening. The, um, there is a, a project that has, I, I don't know that the council is aware of, on Lincoln Avenue, uh, where Greenwich ties into Lincoln, um, we have a, a sidewalk that ends with no pedestrian crossing across Lincoln to tie into the sidewalk that runs the whole length of Lincoln. So we would uh, do a sidewalk extension to bring uh, pedestrians safely to a point where they can then have a marked pedestrian crossing across Lincoln. Uh, that would be the principal avenue for people on Greenwich who would want to access, say, Lincoln Park with their children. They would need to then go down Lincoln and then cross um, again at the marked ped crossing to get to Lincoln Park. Our council had um, already heard a briefing on the sidewalk connections, and we're looking at the Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson Elementary School uh, sidewalk connection on, the, uh, on, uh, on Oak Street and then the uh, South Maple Street sidewalk connection in front of the Henderson House. Those are the two principal sidewalk projects that we're looking at, and we're doing the preliminary engineering for those now. The, um, the paving projects, uh, we do have an extensive amount of paving that will occur this fall. Uh, we have VDOT primary extension dollars that will pave the entirety of Hillwood Avenue from Annandale to the city limits. Uh, when that work is done, we'll put uh, the bike lanes in, we'll keep all the pedestrian crossings, um, and uh, refresh all the parking, all, you know, sort of all, all of the improvements that we've made uh, over the last uh, three years uh, will be reinstalled with brighter uh, thermoplastic paint. <clears throat> um, other uh, paving uh, that's on the list for this fall. Uh, Greenwich itself uh, uh, from West Street to Lincoln would be paved. That also will help us with the ped crossings that are, uh, that are planned there because we'll have fresh pavement down there so that, that those ped crossings will show up and, and last. Um, Great Falls from Little Falls to Lincoln is on the list for paving. That's uh, a street that um, the, the pavement is in uh, bad shape, so we're, uh, that's on the list. The next two really will be dependent on uh, the availability of funds, uh, but Lincoln Avenue uh, from West Street to Great Falls is on the list, and Villa Ridge um, is, is also on the list. Um, and I will note that Oak Street, which has had a lot of work done for gas main replacements and water line replacements, um, that will be repaved. And um, uh, from Broad Street to the bridge, uh, where Trips Run uh, crosses. And then uh, Lee Street will be paved basically to the, the big, you know, from Oak Street to the big left turn. Uh, when you get past that left turn, that's, that part of the street was paved uh, pretty recently. It does have some street cuts, but the, with, because of the, the uh, freshness of the pavement there, the intention is not to repave Lee Street all the way back to Broad, but to, to stop um, essentially at the cul-de-sac there. Um, so that's just some notes on, on paving. Some of the signal improvements that we're doing, um, uh, the Broad and Maple, uh, South Maple, uh, that's, that signal will be rewired. Uh, Little Falls and Broad Street, uh, we have traffic, that, that signal cabinet will be replaced. And then at West and Broad, uh, that signal has been causing us problems, and we will be doing an extensive reworking of that of that intersection. 
Um, and then lastly, I would just note in terms of PED uh, crossings, uh, we are looking to put in uh, PED activated crossings at Lincoln and uh, Great Falls. Uh, that's close to Lincoln Park, and that, that's a pretty heavily used uh, pedestrian area, and there, no, there are no PED crossings there. Um, and we're looking at uh, PED crossings on, uh, on Spring and Lee, and we're getting prices on those as well. So that's a, a quick update on uh, things that are in the operating budget that uh, are, are things that people should see coming this fall. The, um, I will note we will follow up with you. We, we'd like to talk with you directly about your experience. Um, in terms of uh, the, the uh, neighborhood traffic calming program, I don't have, uh, that email didn't come through, but um, I, we will provide a, a, a report of all the projects that are in queue. We do have a significant grant that is being used to fund NTC projects this year and next. Um, uh, but when we talk about the timing for those, you know, grant funds have a, a big process with them. And so we'll, we will follow up with council in terms of those projects and which ones should be fund with local funded with local funds versus the grant funds uh, to make sure that we can produce results on those. Vice Mayor Connolly, thank you very much, Mr. Shields, for that uh, in-depth uh, report. Mrs. Connolly, Ms. Connolly. Thank you. That's a, a big list. My page is full as I've taken notes. Is that list published anywhere where people can find it on the web? Or is there a map that just shows where all these spots are? So we will be working on the communication on those. You know, all these projects, uh, we need to get everybody aware of them because, uh, you know, particularly people who live right by them, they need to know what's going on. So we will get this information out. I requested this information simply for tonight's uh, okay. report mm -hmm. and we will follow up and, and get these uh, get all this information out where people can access it would be great though to have it on a map so people could yeah. really look and see this is where I drive and this is where I live that's right and then a follow-up to the um, question about Marshall Street mm -hmm. I live on George Mason Road I'm your neighbor mm -hmm. and one of the things that that neighborhood struggles with in addition to people going back and forth and is because it's a all those streets are parallel. If one street gets taken care of, then another street has a problem. And I don't think the neighborhood traffic calming program is set up to That's right. address that whole neighborhood. And so I think there needs to be a separate process, as Mr. Lickenhouse and, and Mr. Lickenhouse has formally requested that as well as, as uh, an individual member of council. And, uh, he, and, the, and the, the point is exactly right. If you put something on one street, it, it moves traffic to the other. And so the holistic approach, I think, is the right approach. Um, and uh, so we're taking that up. And, and I also agree that the NTC is probably would struggle with a project that large, just in terms of the petitioning process and, and that. So uh, we're looking at how we, you know, that would end up being a city-driven project as opposed to uh, the the normal NTC project I think is probably the best way that that would that would advance. I know that the West George Mason Road is working on a petition right now for NTC and has been talking to people on Marshall and trying to get others involved. So it would be good to have an update on that to be able to share with them as yeah. well. And Rosemary needs to be part of the discussion and and uh, and Jackson. Yeah. What is it? What does it take for us to get the do not enter without a permit signs during certain hours, similar to what they have on Barry and Cleve. I was talking with some friends that lived there that had an issue with cut through traffic. And once those signs were put up, uh, it, was, uh, it was shown that it helped out immensely. Um, is that a city-driven, staff-driven, council-driven recommendation, or is that an NTC process? Um, if I could get back with you on that, uh, there, um, that if I, let me look into that and get back. I know it was contentious. I got the history of it. It involved Jerry Connolly and a whole bunch of other folks. Um, however, when it was brought to my attention, I thought, you know what, that is a very simple, cheap, meaning doesn't cost a lot of money option. And when you talk about a more holistic approach to cut through streets in that area of town, limiting traffic without a permit 
with spot enforcement because we have limited resources seems like a measure that we could put in place uh, to eliminate cut through traffic from the hours of call it 7.30 to 9 and 3 to 4.30 when we have the most pedestrian traffic with kids walking up and down those streets. So something like that seems like uh, a solution that is cost effective could happen in the near term. And yes, it may ruffle some feathers with folks that don't want to have to obtain a permit. But again, without going into another impassioned speech, we need to do something now for that section of city uh, as opposed to having it drift through a black hole of lists that may be tied to grants one way or the other. All right, Ms. Hardy and then Mr. Z. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate the very detailed update and glad to hear that everything will hopefully get done uh, this fall, which is a very ambitious list. Um, so clearly this matters to all of us and I think as evident by those impassioned speeches, it's probably one of our most important jobs up here. Um, clearly impacts everyone's quality of life. Um, what, I have a broader kind of concern around how we manage um, the intake and triage and prioritization of a lot of these requests. I know we have the NTCQ, which takes care of formal traffic calming, but I think what we're also hearing is requests for sidewalk extensions, requests for crosswalks, things that probably don't fall in traffic calming per se. Um, and I think some of the frustration that we're hearing, especially from the Northwest neighbors who I'm hearing that they've been asking for help for over 12 years now. And so if you're waiting for 12 years, obviously people get pretty tired of waiting it, um, frustrated that it takes a child nearly getting hit before action. Um, what is a better way for us to um, be responsive and to manage those requests? Because I think while the NTCQ works for some situations, there's kind of longstanding neighborhood requests for things that I feel like get lost in the shuffle. Um, so just a broader concern I have is how we just manage those neighborhood requests that may not fall in the, in the purview of traffic calming per se. And then a tactical question around um, how do we prioritize pedestrians? So I know we have things like we're going to add crosswalks, add sidewalks, um, pet activated crossings, all great. Um, I think there's technology we can do. So I think LPIs is one thing I've raised with Mr. Stoddard in the past where we either give pedestrians a head start um, or even give them protected greens. Um, so while I was not hit this weekend, I had an encounter myself where I had a white walk signal. Um, and because there was a green light also for traffic going the same way, they nearly hit me in the crosswalk. Um, so those are the little things we can do with existing technology where we actually can protect pedestrians better, um, which encourages more walkability. So besides putting you know, concrete on the ground and lights, I think there's other things we can do with the technology that's already there. Um, so I would like us to think creatively about those options as well. Um, but we'd love more discussion on how to better kind of intake, triage, prioritize, and then also follow back up with the neighborhood on these requests so we don't have other things that take 12 years before we get back to them. Thank you. Mr. Z. Well, you know, I have uh, heard from lots of people that uh, say, well, why, why, why can't we make our street one way? Why can't we close it off and, and just uh, close off the end of the street? Why can't we put in chicanes? Uh, why can't we have more stop signs? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, before our new planning director came along, uh, there was anathema put up stop signs to uh, for the purpose of traffic calming. and, and uh, uh, in his impeccable wisdom, he now sees that as uh, maybe a hybrid solution that, uh, you know, stop signs at various places can be uh, of assistance. So when I said let's lower the speed limit on um, on some of the streets here, I know what you're hearing in your own mind, city manager, is if you put it, lower the speed limit on one street, they'll go to another street. But let me just assure you that uh, I'm not going to let this issue just stop for uh, I'm not going to uh, put it aside uh, I'm trying to help by not asking you to close off streets or put in chicanes or more speed tables or make entire intersections out of cobblestones uh, you know this all the stuff that comes along and all this is going to cost money but signs are simple so let's try that put aside your prejudices and let's get something done now let's get it done soon. So I ask for a plan for you to come back with these recommendations. And recommendations have to be we will put up some slower speed limit signs and tell people there are new speed limits in place. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
Mr. Duncan. Thank you. Could I just ask a specific question about the signal improvements that you mentioned there towards the end? Thank you for adding Southwest Broad to that. That's something that we've been talking about for uh, the summer, uh, which is now the fall. Is the, uh, is the challenge there, uh, as it was explained to me, a equipment back order challenge or a resources challenge? Uh, what is it that enables us to be hopeful that we would be uh, improving the uh, short switch on the current northbound Southwest Street signal? Yeah, it was a it was a switch in the cabinet that needed to be replaced, and so that part is you know a lot of a lot of these cabinets have old equipment in them, and so getting those parts is tough. And so when we rebuild a, a cabinet, the, what we do is get it up to current spec so that when you when something breaks, it's easy to get a replacement for it. <coughs> um, so uh, is that the, is that the kind of thing that takes you know weeks or months or? Well, for that cabinet, that was that was a tough part to get. Um, so that's what the problem was there. The uh, South uh, Maple and Broad, that's been that's been a very troublesome intersection. So that that one we we would have a cabinet replacement as well as a complete rewiring of that intersection. That. That signal is, I think, it's probably 30 years old as the, the conduits that are in, inside that signal. And so they corrode, they short, it's, um, that needs a complete retrofit. Um, the others it, uh, won't need a complete retrofit because they've had work done on them since, but we'll be doing some pretty comprehensive updates for them. Okay, I think that's great. Um, I don't know if we're done with traffic, but a related uh, question arose. Uh, some of the folks are on East Jefferson Street, uh, the new parking restrictions uh, that are there near the North Gate. Um, there were some concerns that uh, the hours basically make it a challenge for anyone to host an event at their house that would, you know, involve eight or ten cars, uh, therefore making it cumbersome to <coughs> hand each of them a permit and so forth. And I just wonder, uh, are the hours that we uh, restrict parking there now uh, the same as the hours that we restrict parking around the uh, Harris Teeter building in the Winter Hill area? What, what was, I don't remember us talking about right. East Jefferson, so I'm just curious as to what the process was there, what the thinking was. So East Jefferson has had parking restrictions for years that was geared towards uh, Metro mm -hmm. parkers that right. would park there and then walk through the park to get to Metro. And uh, those weren't really hitting the mark for uh, what the promise had been to the neighborhood is that the North Gate would park itself. Mm -hmm. And so we changed the hours for that after going through a, you know, a, a petition process with that neighborhood um, and going through the options with them. Um, I, I couldn't quote you exactly what those hours are. Um, that, so I'll, I'll get back with you. Okay, that. yeah, if the objective is a commendable objective to keep people in Northgate, parking in Northgate, uh, I just wonder if, you know, the hours could be like 11 to 6 a.m. or something, which would not maybe impinge on people who would be having folks over to their house on East Jefferson Street, uh, you know, uh, that might be a 9 or 10 o'clock activity. I just don't know when the hours begin, but if you could let us know. and Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, one thing that came up at the uh, Founders Row Neighbors Meeting, which you were at, Mr. Manager, uh, was the condition of Northwest Street itself there at the construction site, which, of course, no pain, no gain. It's a construction site. It is going to be disrupted for at least another year and a half, two years probably. Uh, I will say that <laughs> given the condition of Northwest Street right now, if nothing is done to it for the next year and a half or two, uh, we'd, we'd best make sure that we don't have scooters going down there because it's just we're going to lose them in you know the washboard potholes. So I we haven't really talked about you know a development of that scale is kind of unusual for us. You know interim <laughs> maintenance of the street during the time of construction so that it's uh, you know passable for vehicles without bone jarring. Uh, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about what we would tell neighbors 
in that area about the condition, you know, Steeples Court, some of those folks who are there in and out every day. Well, that's right. Um, and the, some of the neighbors good humoredly did note that it did slow the traffic. It down. Does, does a great job of slowing <laughs> it down, but that. if it keeps up at the current pace, it'll 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 be a junkyard, you know. Um, let me get back with you on that. I do know that Route Seven, uh, with when the sewer line work is done, they will uh, put in a, a patch that's much smoother. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> But let me check on, uh, I, I don't know for a fact that Northwest is scheduled at the same time or whether that's a different uh, Yeah, I kind of got the impression that it wasn't, which concerned me a little bit. Okay, thank you for looking at it. I mean, I can't improve on everything that's been said by my colleagues about traffic calming, so I won't try. I mean, living on Southwest Street since 1985, I've been yelling at people running through the stop sign for generations now. Uh, it's just a problem. You know, we live in a busy, congested area. And during rush hours, it's particularly exasperating. Um, uh, there have been some successes, I think, on Southwest Street itself. Uh, you know, we went from uh, no real uh, visual indicators to narrow the perceived width of the street to when we did a repaving, uh, you know, painting the lines back in, painting crosswalks, parking lanes, and I think it, it has helped. It's not perfect. I mean, I still pull out of my driveway looking both ways three times. Um, but it, you know, the things that we can do will help. Uh, I think what we're hearing is that we just need to do more of them and we need to do more of them faster and that is, of course, a budget issue. Thanks. All right. Ms. Hardy. All right, one last thing. Um, you mentioned parking and so while we've got stormwater transportation and parking, we've got the trifecta. Um, why you just prompted me to remember that I think planning was doing some sort of um, post-mortem study on parking utilization in mixed-use buildings. So I think I'm hearing some mixed things. I know we had preemptively restricted parking in Winter Hill in advance of 301 West Broad, but then hearing that there's actually very little overflow parking that happens in Winter Hill, but then I'm hearing that Northgate might have a different issue. Uh, whenever that study is done, I think council would probably be really interested in the results of that to know whether we do have impacts of um, parking spillage, I guess, into neighborhood streets and how we should respond to that across the city. Because it seems like at some point we might be heading towards kind of zone permit parking across the city, but I would like data to kind of um, back that up before we talk about that further. Okay, and I think the study is is uh, intended. Mr. Stoddard is here, just very briefly. The um, we uh, we did a study to update our zoning code on commercial on office parking ratios, and I think the uh, principal intent of the study is to look at our residential parking ratios from a zoning perspective. Is there a component to it to look at spillover parking and what the experience has been outside our mixed use projects? I didn't. Uh, just a question. The uh, <coughs> briefly, uh, the focus of the study is on uh, parking occupancy within the new mixed use buildings. About eight mixed use buildings that have gone up <coughs> over the last 15, 20 years in the city. Looking at the use of both the residential parking as well as the retail parking. This will be dovetailed uh, with the study that the EDA is doing to look at retail parking utilization in the commercial areas. Uh, this is a follow-up effort to update the co uh, commercial parking standards were updated. This is the idea of looking at residential parking standards. Uh, it's also a follow-up to the city's uh, long-range plans for transportation in the city, and I think it is important to remember that uh, if you build lots of parking, then you will attract lots of cars. Uh, so instead, if you can invest in things like sidewalks, transit, scooters, bicycles, uh, other ways for people <coughs> to get around, they will find ways to use those that work for them. Uh, we can look at the scope and review uh, and make sure we are getting some sense of whether there is spillover parking from those, uh, from those buildings. Uh, the study should be doing its counts in October uh, if everything stays on board and preliminary results would then be available at the end of the calendar year. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. Let's move on to business on the agenda. And remember, we do have a closed session at the end of this meeting. So, uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the first item? Yes. We have TO 19-05, Ordinance to Amend Chapter 44, Vegetation, and Chapter 48, Zoning of the City Code of the City of Falls Church to change the name of the Cre Tree Commission to the Urban Forestry Commission. All right. Tell us about it. OK. Um, as I said in the staff report, the Tree Commission is not made up of tree experts. That's what we have staff for. The Tree Commission, 
as they were called, <coughs> has been taking a much broader view. What they tell me, their job is to influence what I do. They tell me what the community wants Falls Church to be like. And it's my job to implement it. So that's a much wider view than looking at a tree here or a tree there. It was actually the Tree Commission's own idea to change their name to the Urban Forestry Commission, but unfortunately, Dennis Szymanski's not feeling well tonight, or he'd be here himself. Um, but I value their input enormously, and I think they're a great commission. I notice uh, later on the agenda, you're appointing us a new member. Um, we've got volunteers now lined up to help. I think things are moving along really nicely, and um, I would appreciate your approving the change to Urban Forestry Commission. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak to this matter? I see none, the matter is closed to the public. Are there any comments, questions, motion? <coughs> Mr. Z? Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, it is a reflection of our times here that uh, uh, the citizens recognize uh, the importance of canopy cover and and have adopted a view that is more than specific to individual trees. Uh, um, up to about a decade ago, they were maybe more concerned with preservation of individual trees and tree and specimen trees, but now uh, they see this um, the canopy cover as uh, playing a vital role in. Um, our quality of life and uh, also as it uh, uh, works to uh, increase our resilience to climate change. So uh, I am happy to move to DOP TO 19-05. Second. All right. Madam Clerk. Could I ask a question? Okay. Thanks. Just administrative. Uh, the National Arbor Day folks who give us tree city recognition, they're going to be okay with us changing it from tree commission to urban forestry, right? They won't think that that's some sneaky way to not, not meet their standards. The city actually needs either a professional forestry staff or a board or commission that oversees urban forestry. The name or title of that board or commission is not important. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, Madam Clerk. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Duncan. Yes. Ms. Hardy. Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse. Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your good work and for sticking around. Madam Clerk, next item. Yes, we have TRO 19-31, resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the FY 2020 capital funding agreement, CFA, among Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA, and the contributing jurisdictions. All right, Ms. Messner? Good evening, Council. This is the annual CFA uh, funding agreement between the contributing jurisdictions and WMATA for their ongoing capital. It is um, a process that's been gone ongoing at an annual basis. We are, as the staff report indicates, looking to do a new long-term six-year plan so we have a more robust and transparent process. The dollar amounts outlined in the staff report are consistent with your adopted FY20 budget. Um, I've provided um, the schedule for when the other Northern Virginia localities are adopting. And this CFA is consistent with the past ones council approved, except for two major areas. One is improving the reporting requirements, so as localities were more aware in advance of changes to the CIP reprogramming, and also to break out the budget line uh, to show the debt so it's different for localities versus the state's contribution. This is necessary to match our federal dollars that will hopefully continue to come to WMATA. Glad to answer any questions. Staff recommendation is to improve this and then we'll be continuing to work with WMATA and our peer localities to get a more robust six-year CFA in place. All right, thank you so much for your fine work. Mr. Snyder, I might ask you, do you uh, since you're so close to this, uh, this uh, issue, if you have any comments before we move on to the rest of council. Um, not sure how much I want to admit that, uh, no, just kidding. Um, yeah, um, so I think this is something we need to do. Um, I'm hoping that we'd have a little more transparency from Metro regarding what's directly of value or indirect value to Falls Church because it is a significant amount of money that we're contributing uh, to them. but. 
there's no way we're going to uh, approach the climate issues if we let Metro go down. So I don't think there's a real option there, but I, I do think that might be useful. Secondly, we were told in NVTC that some of the above ground stations are going to be shut down for several months next summer like they were in Alexandria, and those would be the above ground stations between uh, Ballston and um, I guess it would include East Falls Church, West Falls Church, Dunloring. Um, and so I think we want to know what, what Metro is going to put in place to provide transportation options during that, uh, during that period. So if you could include that along with our um, commitment um, if, if we vote on it tonight. Sure. All right, anything else? Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak to this matter? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Thank you, Ms. Messner and Mr. Snyder for your work. Uh, do we have a motion? Okay, well, I guess... Uh, Don't everybody <laughs> jump at once. <laughs> I think that means it falls to me. Move to the WTR 19-31. Second. All right, Madam Clerk. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Duncan. Yes. Ms. Hardy. Yes. Mr. Lickenhaus. Yes. Mr. Snyder. Yeah. Mr. Z. No. Mayor Tarter. Yes. Thank you, Council. Motion carries six to one. Thank you, Council. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's move on to the consent uh, agenda. Does anyone wish to um, remove any item from the consent agenda? All right. Um, I don't think there's any explanation, dude. It looks like they're all just essentially appointments to various boards and commissions. Um, do we have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Um, is there any other business before I move on to a closed session? Any business not in the agenda? Any council member comments? Any reports? Um, yes, Mr. Duncan. Uh, just reports. I wanted to thank those of you who were involved with the Coalition for Smarter Growth's <coughs> walking tour of West Falls Church that occurred on Saturday. The mayor was there, Mr. Whitkenhouse, Ms. Hardy. I, several members of the Planning Commission and others, the focus of the event was on the railroad cottages, but we really toured the entire West End, so we talked about the West Falls Church Economic Development Project on the high school side, uh, safety and inter-jurisdictional relations uh, in terms of trying to improve safety and uh, uh, conditions on Shreve Road with the county, uh, the bike trail and uh, what's going to be occurring there. Down to the railroad cottages where we had a nice uh, visit with uh, residents there and heard about their experiences to the, in the city in the short time they've lived here. They're all very positive about it. And then uh, over the bike ridge to uh, Founders Row site and uh, West End Park and then up the Broad Street to uh, talk a little bit about the federal realty and buyer properties long-term prospects. It was a good event. Uh, it was uh, organized, as I said, by the Coalition for Smarter Growth, and there were remarks by uh, the mayor and Ms. Hardy and others. Uh, had some folks from other jurisdictions who were there. Uh, it was a good opportunity to showcase uh, what we've done in terms of smart growth and what we hope to do more of in the future. Uh, the Economic Development Committee would like to meet this Thursday at 2 o'clock, I think, Mr. Shields. Yes, sir. Is that still all right with you? Yes, sir. Okay, I thought we might spend a little time. We talk a lot about the big projects. Uh, Ms. Hardy's done tremendous work on the downtown effort, and since this meeting occurs right before the big park dedication on September 30th of Mr. Brown's downtown park, I thought we might just go over what's going to happen uh, there on Monday. and. Uh, and I'd like to spend a little time uh, focusing on the existing shopping centers on the West End, uh, which uh, are going through some transitions and new tenants and improvements, and uh, just like uh, folks to know that we are paying attention to the medium and small things too, even as we also do the big projects. Um, the next time that we meet is, I think, going to be into October. So I just wanted to make the public aware of a forum for the uh, school board candidates being hosted by 
on uh, Tuesday, October, I'm th sorry, Thursday, October 3rd uh, by CBC, American Legion, Chamber of Commerce, City Republican Democratic Committees, 7 o'clock, Thursday, October 3rd for the four school board candidates at the American Legion Hall on 400 North Oak Street. And finally, uh, might ask the manager, do we know if anything is going to be happening at the Fellows property or at the Howard Herman Stream Valley Park entrance uh, between now and when we next meet, or is that likely? Are those likely to be October activities? Um, so Stream Valley Park, I'm, uh, they're do out there doing work today, getting the trail fixed up from the flood damage, um, and the sign will go in uh, before the end of this month. So uh, we would like to commemorate that with you. We just need to work out the details of where that works for you all on uh, on o that October date, where we'll have the dedication for uh, Larry Graves' turf field. The fellow's property, um, let me get back with you on that. I know that the demolition is in progress, but I don't have the latest, like a date, or when, when, when exactly that's going to happen. Um, but your question is a commemoration or a public event to note that it is now in public ownership and um, that has not been arranged we need to do it and let me work with you on that to get that set up i meant to mention graves too but you brought it up so are we thinking that that still might be on october the 5th as we earlier discussed or? yes uh so larry graves uh, turf field is complete and um and the fairfax county park authority would like to join us on saturday october 5th to have a ribbon cutting for it and a celebration of that all right i think that'd be great okay thank you all right. Anything else? Sorry. One other thing. Thank you to the Jim Snyder. Anything. Sorry uh, for uh, his note about the cleanup around the Rite Aid site. We appear to have finally identified the yeah. entity which will be responsible for mowing the uh, site every couple of weeks. Uh, uh, but please keep us posted on the progress of that and also the removal of the trash that's accumulated around the dumpster. Well, actually, they're donation bins, but they serve as dumpsters in the back. Uh, there was a couch there and other things that we'd like to see removed. Yeah. Jim Snyder has been doing a lot of work to work with uh, the zoning administrator on regular enforcement of the property maintenance code, and this has been sort of project number one, but we want to have steady and regular enforcement. All right. Unless there's anything else, why don't we go into minutes? Um, we've got the minutes of May 28th, 2019. Mr. Duncan? On uh, the minutes of May 28th, uh, it should be 2019, not 0219. I know it sometimes seems like we take one step forward and two steps back, but we haven't gone that far back. They're in line five. And on one, uh, line 190, uh, it's just FY20, I think, not two FY20. Uh, so with those corrections, I move approval of the minutes of the meeting of Tuesday, May 28th. All right. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. One abstention. Mr. Snyder is an abstention. May tw or June 24, 2019. Mr. Mayor, on line 39. Mm -hmm. Uh, just drop that. Ask the council to postpone action. Well, actually, just look at the wording of there. There appear to be too many words in one place and not enough later. So uh, clean that up a little bit. And uh, in line 202 said he would prefer shall since there were two options, I think, not just one option. Those corrections, I move approval of the minutes of Monday, June 24, 2019. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Is there anything else that needs to be said before we go into closed session? All right, I'm going to go ahead and read a motion um, and see if we have support to go into closed session. Upon a motion made by council member, uh, sir, yes, would you like to speak? All right. If you could state your name and address for the record, please. Todd Friedlander, 801 Hillwood Avenue. I uh, caught a little bit of this looking for the game, and I saw that you guys were talking about the stormwater. And so I said, oh, i got to go down here, see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I missed it. Um, but I want to just let the council know that we're still out here. There are people that are on Hillwood Avenue and elsewhere in the city that have stormwater and sanitary issues. And I don't know if the report has started. We were told in the meeting in July or August that uh, there would be a, a, a citizens group convened to assist with the report. 
I just want to make sure that, I don't know if that's already started, it's, it's, I guess today's the first day of fall, so I'm assuming that the report should be starting soon if it hasn't already. I also read you guys have two and a half million dollars of surplus, should be plenty of money for a good comprehensive report that covers storm and sanitary, because in my view you cannot study one without the other. Uh, and <clears throat> as a professional, as an architect, when I do studies for entities, if they give us the approval, we'll go ahead and say, well, let's, let's study everything. We'll figure out what you can afford later. So I think it's important that whatever study happens addresses and studies all of the watershed in Falls Church, all of the sewer shed in Falls Church together, because the sewer issues I have in my house and my neighbors have in their houses happens when the stormwater system is full, not just on July 8th, but on other days of the year. So I just want to put that out there, and I'd love some communication back. You know, I saw this come up. I, I put my name on the email list, did not hear anything, wasn't sure of the progress. So I need to be better about looking ahead to the council, but I was expecting, since my first foray into city government, I was expecting a little bit more uh, uh, communication from staff or wh whomever to alert me and the, as citizen of these issues. So thank you. Well, thanks, th go ahead. I was just going to say thank you for coming out. The city manager did a fairly detailed report earlier in the evening, okay. but maybe you all could get connected. Um, and Mr. Shields, certainly you're welcome to respond as well. Well, I do. Um, we need to do a better job of communicating out. Um, what I did report on earlier is, is uh, the scope of work for our engineering firm. The Hillwood Avenue area is a study area, and um, the and we're going to be letting the letting everybody's on that list serve know about that, and we'll also put it up on the website so and everybody all, can all know of Hill because there was two issues on Hillwood. There was storm and up upper and the sanitary in yep. the lower part. That's right. Was, everything was included on that. Yeah. Well, the the GKY study is focused on storm, um, but your point is well taken. Uh, we know that people have had the, the uh, back backflows in the basements um, during storms. That's right. Um, the uh, so we will get back with you on on the on the process going forward, okay. just so you're well informed about that. In terms of the citizen group, we did want to get the engineering uh, work underway and have um, all the information gathered together along with options before we got that group together, and then we use them in a in a use your time and the citizens' time as effectively as possible with good information. Um, and so we're waiting just a little bit longer than what I had originally envisioned to get that group stood up. But I think that will be uh, soon, like in the November, December time frame. So what's the duration you anticipate for the report? Um, the, uh, so GKY has gotten the scope of work from us. They're looking at it right now. They've been out in the field uh, to take a look at it as well. And now we're, we're getting their engineering uh, proposal with the cost to do the engineering work, and that's what we're waiting on right now. And the scope of work, has that been shared with the listserv? No, it has It has not. And we're a little bit leery of doing that without having gotten GKY's response to it yet, which is the reason we held back. Okay. Because I guess in terms of the, the study areas, if you're parceling that off, there might be folks that were at that meeting that said, wait a second, my street's left off, and it would be a shame for that to happen. So, Understood. All right, thank you. And I tell you, if you'd like, you can certainly give the assistant city manager your information. We're about to go into closed session, but you're welcome to talk with her and make sure she has your um, uh, contact information so you can uh, be informed as best as possible from city uh, outreach. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, let me go ahead and read this motion. Upon a motion made by council member Connolly, <coughs> seconded by council member Hardy. Uh, and passed by a vote of City Council. Council went in a closed session pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A19 for discussion of information subject to exclusion in Subdivision 2 of 14 of 2.2-3705.2, where discussion in an open meeting would jeopardize the safety of any person or the security of any facility, building, structure, information technology system, or software program or discussion of reports or plans related to the security of any government facility, building, or structure, or the safety of persons using such, such facility, building, or structure. And this is security briefing for City Council. Councilmember Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. 
Hardy? Yes. Lichtenhouse? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Z? Yes. Tartar? Yep. All right, it is, I don't know what time is it, 917. Uh, Mr. Shields, we're going to meet in here somewhere else. Yes, sir. We'd like to stay right here in this room. All right, do we need to get the cameras taken down? We, uh, just have them turn them off and clear the, the room. All right, why don't we take a short break to let the cameras come down, and uh, maybe people can use the restroom if they need to. All right, we are coming out of a closed session with a motion from council member Litkenhouse. Seconded by council member Hardy. Hardy, and a hearty thanks to you. And passed by a vote of city council. Council reconvened in open session. Council member Conley. Yes. Duncan. Yes. Hardy. Yes. Lichtenhouse. Yes. Snyder. Yeah. Z. Yes. Tartar. Yep. All right, it is sometime at night. What time? 1006. 10.06. Let's do our certification. Upon a motion made by Council Member Connolly, seconded by Council Member Duncan, and passed upon affirmative roll call vote in open session, it was certified that only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting were convened, were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session or meeting by the body. Council Member Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Lichtenhouse? Yeah. Snyder? Yeah. Z? Yeah. Tartar? Yep. All right. Uh, is there anything else to be said tonight? We're going to move to adjourn. Let's do it. We're adjourned. <laughs>